Well, hello, church. Welcome to week number two in our new series through the book of Ephesians called God's Idea of Church. I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today. It's my, it's my prayer that when we're finished here today, as always, that we would be encouraged and that we will have a better perspective on, on who God is and on his involvement in our lives. It's important that, that we seek to learn these things because the truth is we serve we serve a mighty God. He is mighty in power. And I think that often we, we limit our minds to, to how powerful we think he really is. We allow our, our finite understanding, we allow it to overshadow his infinite ability. God is able to do all things. And, I, and I've been praying uh, quite a bit this week, seeking the Lord just, just for you know, just for direction and, and wisdom. And, and I've been praying that God would open the eyes of our hearts to see him in a way that, that we never have before. Because I believe that we are, all, we are all ready to see things through spiritual eyes. I know I am. And I pray that you are too. That we can walk by faith and, and not by sight. To see things through the eyes of a citizen of heaven instead of a citizen of this broken world. Right? I, I, I want to see everything through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of Jesus Christ. And, and I pray that you do too, because that's so important for us as Christians to be able to discern and see things through the eyes of Jesus and not just through the eyes uh, of what we're told and the eyes of this world. So right where you are, I want you to ask God to give you a greater faith today. I want you to ask God to give you deeper wisdom and insight as we read through his word together today. But before we get into our text, there's, there's something that's super important that I need to mention. And that is that today is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day uh, to each and every father out there, whether, uh, whether you're a father, a grandfather, a father-to-be, uh, wherever you fit into the spectrum, today is the day where we honor you. And it's a day that we should honor you. You need to be honored. It's important that we honor our fathers. We need to acknowledge their roles in our lives. Listen, the truth is the role of a father is one of the most influential roles that we will ever have on this planet. It really is. Now, listen, I know that not everyone has a great relationship with their father. And if that's you, I'm sorry. We live in, we live in a broken world full of flawed and broken people. Uh, but the good news is that we, we all have a perfect father in heaven who loves us and cares for us unconditionally. And even if our, our earthly fathers may have fallen short, we know that our, our heavenly father, he's never going to fail us. He, he's a good father. So you can rest in that. You can, you can rest in his unconditional love for you, the unconditional love of your heavenly father. And you can honor him today for choosing you as his child before the foundations of the earth. And our heavenly father should be the model for how our earthly fathers take care of us down here. And let me tell you, I, I have been so blessed uh, with a father who loved me and supported me and showed me the love of Jesus. I'm so grateful. It was a gift from God that I had a father uh, who, who loved me the way that he did. And let me tell you, you know that, that you were blessed with an honorable father when, when, you, when you go to write him a letter for Father's Day and, and you sob like a baby the entire time because the whole time you were overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude and understanding that you were loved. Or at least so I've heard. I mean, I would never do that when I was writing a letter. But anyway, I'm sure that, that some people do. I hope that, that you do something special for your father today. Let him know that you love him and that you are grateful for him. So once again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. We honor you. We say thank you for all that you do for us. And, and we say thank you, Jesus, for our fathers and for putting them into our lives, Father. And I pray that you would give us the opportunity uh, to show them how much we love them and how much we appreciate what they've done. Father, I pray for, for every father uh, who's watching today that they would, they would have a deeper understanding of you so that they can, so that they can uh, do their role even better. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our passage today is Ephesians 
chapter 1, starting in verse 15. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and read along with me. Uh, If not, the words will will be on the screen as I read as always. Uh, But this is what it says. It says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, Father, we ask that uh, you would take this passage that we just read and that it would just infiltrate our hearts, that we would let it, uh, let it do what your word does, Father. Let it change us. Let us see things through your eyes. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would soften our hearts, soften our minds, and just open the eyes of our hearts to see and understand your word the way that you want us to. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, have you, have you ever been that person who isn't able to, to see something that everyone else seems to be able to see? Have you, have, you, have you ever been there? It's kind of frustrating. When, when I was a kid, one of the things that, that we always loved to do as a family, we looked forward to it, was what we called the Williams County Fair. And it came to our little town every September, I believe. And it was, it was a very festive time. There were tons of vendors, lots of people you knew, so just lots of, lots of fellowship. There were rides, uh, the kind of rides that usually make you want to wanna throw up uh, after you ride them, at least when you get older, because they just spin and spin and spin. Uh, but, but there was also tons and tons of unhealthy food. I remember it seemed like every single year, the popular item was some sort of deep fried food. They were always trying something new every year. I think it started out with deep fried Oreos, which didn't seem so crazy because they're fantastic. But then it went to deep fried Twinkies. One year it was deep fried pickles. Um, but I will say one of the best years was when they did deep fried cheese on a stick. It was like this big and it was just full of cheese. It was, it was amazing. It was really, really good. But um, I'll never forget the year... I think it was probably in the early 90s, um, but one of the, uh, the book vendors, there were a lot of vendors that set up there and, and tried to advertise, but one of the book vendors that year uh, had a huge crowd of people there at his booth uh, all year long, or all week long that year. And uh, we too were also drawn in when we were actually able to get up close to the table to see what all the fuss was, was really about. Uh, but what it was, was it was this brand new book that was full of pictures that if you looked at them the right way, you would see images in them in, in 3D. And a lot of you probably remember these very popular books. They were called Magic Eye. I actually Googled it to find out approximately when these books were released and, and apparently it was back in, they, they came into North America in 1993. Here's actually what they look like if you want to see a picture of one of these. Now, just so you know, as you're looking at this picture, this is a picture that says, I love you with a heart in the middle of it. Can you see it? I mean, come on. It's pretty obvious, right? It's right there in front of you. I usually just cross my eyes and let them slowly adjust and then it sort of comes into focus. Can you see it? See, I remember as a kid, I could not see it. If I remember correctly, everyone in my family could see it except for this guy. And I think I was probably nine years old if it was 93. Um, But my mom, I remember she'd tell me how you do it. And then she'd ask, can you see it? 
And I'd say, no, I can't see it. So the vendor would tell me how to do it. And then he'd say, do you see it? And I'd say, no, I can't see it. And I remember it infuriated me because I knew it was there. Everyone else around me could see it. But for some reason, I couldn't see it. It just seemed like I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. And I don't remember when it was or how it came about. But finally, somebody tells me, cross your eyes and then let them slowly adjust while staring at the picture. And I was instantly able to see it. It came into focus. Everything changed. And then I couldn't not see it. You know what I mean? It was, it was so obvious. And the truth is, sometimes we can't even see what's right in front of us until we've been aware of it. I mean, am I the only one who has searched high and low to find my glasses and I finally realized that I've been wearing them the whole time? I know I'm not the only one who's done that. Or what about searching for the car keys that have you've been holding in your hand the entire time? See, sometimes, sometimes we don't see because we don't understand. Sometimes we don't see because we don't know how. It's the same with spiritual things. It's no different. The truth is right in front of us, but so often we live our lives blind to the spiritual things around us. Right? Only God can reveal some of these things. The question is, can you see it? So that's the, that's the title of my message today. Can you see it? Can you see it? Turn to the person who's watching this with you and say, I can see it. Because it's my hope that when we're done here today, you can. I can see it. Can you? See, we need to have the eyes of our hearts enlightened uh, to see the greatness of God. Can you see it? We need, we need to have the eyes of our hearts enlightened so that, so that we can see how God sees us. Can you see it? We need to have the, the eyes of our hearts enlightened in order to understand what we possess as, as members of Christ's church, as members of his body, members of his new community that Christ shed his blood for. Can you see it? Listen, this is what Jesus does, right? He, he opens our eyes to see things in, in a new way. He opens our eyes to see him and understand who he is. And several times throughout the Gospels, Jesus physically heals the eyes of blind men so that, so that they can see. And, and once their eyes had been opened, they were also enlightened, being able to see and understand who Jesus is and, and what he had done for them. So when God opens our eyes to, to something, we gain spiritual understanding. And sometimes uh, what we've needed to see has been right in front of us the whole time. Because God is the one who reveals it to us by enlightening the eyes of our hearts. He opens the eyes of our hearts so that we can understand. So, like I said, I'm hoping that through the word of God today, the eyes of your heart will be opened to these life-changing truths that are laid out for us in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, uh, just to give you a, a real quick recap on this very insightful letter uh, that we will be looking at for the next 10 weeks, the book of Ephesians was, was written by the Apostle Paul. It was while he was in prison or on house arrest in the city of Rome, and he wrote it to the saints in Ephesus, which, which means he wrote it to the church in Ephesus, because the term saint w was directed towards those who belonged to Christ, Christians. And it was, it was most likely what they called a circular letter, meaning it was intended for other churches in addition to the one in Ephesus. So, so this letter was meant for all churches, big, small. And his purpose was to give general instruction on what God's idea was for his church in terms of, of doctrine, unity, and Christian living. So you could say that, that these are the instructions for God's new community, the community that was created in Christ through his blood, the community that we belong to as, as those who are in Christ. Now, Paul had just finished telling us about the, the significance of belonging to Christ and how there, are, how there are blessings attached to that belonging, 
uh, which were we talked about last week. They were redemption, forgiveness, discernment, and inheritance, and being sealed by the Holy Spirit. And then that's where we're going to pick up today in verse 15. So if you missed last week's message, uh, the blessings of belonging, I highly encourage that you go watch that because it ties right into this. Actually, this whole, this whole series is going to sort of play off of one another. So I, I hope that you continue to, to, to watch these sermons and stay up to date. So he says this, he says, for this reason, in other words, because you belong to Christ and because you have these, uh, these blessings in Christ, he says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So Paul points out two things here that are very important, two things that are, that are prayer worthy, two things that should be held in high regard, and ultimately two things that should be recognized and supported within God's new community. And those two things are, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love toward all the saints. Faith and love. See, it starts with faith. Faith in the truth of Jesus Christ. Faith in his, his redemptive work on the cross. Faith in his promises. Complete trust in Jesus Christ. And then in that faith, love should flow out of it. Not just love for the people that you get along with. Not just for for the people who make you smile and make you laugh, but love for all the saints. Faith in Jesus and love for others should go hand in hand. So Paul commends the Ephesians here for their faith and their love because those are the basics for a healthy and thriving godly community. If we can't get these things down, church, th then we need to go back to the basics until we mature in our faith. In order to love one another, we need to have strong faith in Jesus Christ. But that faith will grow as we learn to love one another. And apparently, uh, the church in Ephesus is doing very, very well in this area. And he says, since I've heard that you've got the basics down uh, like a well-oiled machine, uh, he says, I thank God for you and I pray for you. And then he says, what his prayer is in verse 17. He says, I pray that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Listen, our walk with Jesus, our journey of faith never stops until we leave this world. We look ahead, right? That's that's what we do as Christians. We look forward to what God has next for us. And we need to be very careful not to fall into this mindset of this is it, right? This mindset of, of complacency or, or a mindset of I've already done my part. That's dangerous. Listen, the truth is, if you're not dead, then he's not done with you. There is still more to learn and more to do. And we need to add wisdom and revelation to our faith and love. That's what happens as we grow deeper. And that only happens in the knowledge of Christ. And let me tell you, bluntly, you don't know all there is to know about God. I don't know all there is to know about God. In fact, the more I learn about God, the more I realize I don't know very much. But he reveals things to us as we are able to, to handle and process the truth that he gives. But we need to keep seeking. We need wisdom. Proverbs tells us that the fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning to all wisdom. Read his word. Fear the Lord. Revere him. That's where wisdom starts. But then there's revelation which means to, to make known or, or to reveal what was previously hidden. So it's, it's seeing or knowing what once was not visible or not yet known. Does that make sense? The truth is revelation can be extremely subtle sometimes. It, it's not always 
a huge event or experience like a, a baby's gender reveal or a college acceptance letter. That's a form of, of revelation as we become aware of these things. But did you know that every relationship, whether romantic or platonic, every relationship requires revelation? Did you know that? You cannot get to know me unless I reveal myself to you. And you cannot get to, I cannot get to know you unless you reveal yourself to me. Every relationship requires revelation. You have to reveal uh, who you are to someone in order to truly know them and vice versa. I actually heard a story about a couple who got married after going through all the appropriate steps of marriage, right? Counseling and all those sorts of things where they were taught to talk about the tough issues and situations in life and reveal their hearts to each other. And on their honeymoon, as they were landing in Hawaii, she turns to him and says, I want out. I, I never really wanted to marry you. And I know that sounds terrible, and it is. But the truth is, she kept her true feelings hidden. She did not reveal herself, her heart, to him like she should have. Because in order uh, to truly know someone, it, it requires revelation. You can't get past the surface without revelation, church. And it's the same with God. As we get to know Him, He reveals Himself to us. So Paul basically prays that they would get to know God in a more intimate way. That their relationship with the Father would go deeper in wisdom and revelation. In other words, Paul wants them to see what they hadn't yet seen. Isn't that the cry of all of our hearts? As Christians, we should want to see more of God. We should want to experience more of what God has. He, he, he's telling us what he's praying right here. And he says, he's praying for God to reveal these things. In verse 18, he says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Now, a quick side note, uh, the translation of the word heart here, uh, and many times throughout Scripture, to be honest, is referring to our entire being, the core of our intelligence and our will. So, uh, so some, some translations would rightly say it more like, uh, open the eyes of our understanding, because to understand is to see. So he says, having the eyes of your heart or understanding enlightened. And then he gives us three things that he wants us to see. So he says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That's the first thing. He wants us to see and understand. And then he says that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's the second thing that he wants us to see and understand. And lastly, he says that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And then he elaborates on this power and what it is. He says, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ. There's that word that we talked about a lot last week. He worked it in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Okay, so three things that Paul wants us to know come down to these. The hope, the riches, and the power. So let's break these three things down that Paul wants the eyes of our hearts to be opened to. So the first thing is this, the hope to which he has called you. The hope to which he has called you. It's Jesus, church. You have the greatest hope that this world could ever know. Hope, hope is basically what you look forward to right? You have Jesus. The Bible says that we have a living hope in Christ. I love that. My hope is alive. 
It's a hope that goes beyond the temporary hope of this world, right? It, this hope goes beyond the weekend. This hope goes beyond our, our, our next paycheck. This is an eternal hope. My question is, can you see it? Does, does that hope change the way that you see your place in this world? Because it should. Does that hope change the way that you, that you see people around you? Does that hope change the way that you live your life? It should. Listen, last week uh, we talked in, in detail about our position in Christ, right? What it looks like to belong to something outside of this temporary world. Jesus is our hope. He is our hope for today. He's our hope for tomorrow, and he's our hope for eternity. And let me tell you something. This, this world, the people around you, your neighbors, your friends, some of your family, they need hope. This world is hopeless without Christ. It desperately needs Jesus. Can you see it? Do you see that? Are you aware of it? Do, do, do you know what I see? I see people putting their hope in their next promotion. I see people putting their hope in, in the American dream. I see people putting their hope uh, in their comfort. I see people putting their hope in their, in their politics. Right now, I see a lot of people putting their hope in moral causes and, and social movements, things that on the surface seem like they will bring them fulfillment and happiness, but it's just chasing the wind because it's not eternal. And in the end, all that matters is Jesus. First, First Timothy 4.10 says, To this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. In Him we find our hope. In Him we have no fear of death. Why? Because we were raised to life with Him. That's hope. In Him we have the fullness of joy. In Him, we have all that we ever need. And we can look forward with confidence that we are and forever will be safe and secure in the Savior's hands. Jesus is our hope. And I wonder today, can you see it? Does the name of Jesus bring you hope? You know what brings me hope is when I'm, when I'm watching a, a, a TV show and for some reason they throw in the hope of Jesus Christ. It brings me hope when I hear his name. Does the name of Jesus bring you hope? I love to see Jesus going out into the world. Can you see that, that when God chose you before the foundations of the earth and predestined you for adoption like we talked about last week, can you see that he called you to that hope? He chose you and he called you to Jesus from the beginning of time. The Bible says that this hope is an anchor for our souls. I love that. This hope keeps us in place and it gives us peace in a world that desperately needs Jesus. See, he's not only the hope for believers, but he's the hope for the entire world. Do you see it? When you think of Jesus, do you immediately feel hopeful? I hope that you do, because Jesus is truly the hope to which we have been called. So Paul, he, he prays that, that God would open the eyes of our hearts to see. And he wants us to see the hope that we have in Jesus. And then the next thing he wants us to see is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, this is interesting because last week we talked about the inheritance that you and I, that we have been blessed with as those who are in Christ, right? You have an inheritance and I have an inheritance as Christians, and that inheritance is Jesus Christ himself, eternal life in his presence, your inheritance, your belonging, that is, that is, is the inheritance that we have. So, so Jesus and all that he is and all that he has is the inheritance of the believer. And Paul tells us now 
that God also has an inheritance. Isn't that interesting? God also has an inheritance. And that inheritance is us. You and me. God's people, the saints, His children. And the most riveting part is that as His inheritance, He considers us His riches. We are His treasure. We are valuable to Him. You are valuable. You have immeasurable worth in the eyes of God. And I wonder today, can you see it? Do you see yourself as valuable to God? You are the riches of God. You you are valuable and nothing in this world will ever change that. God sees his people as, as as his wealth. And and he knows what is his. You are loved. You are significant. You are favored because you are a child of God. Can you see it? Because if you do, then that truth should fill you with confidence. You should walk with your head held high because you are wanted and valued by the creator of the universe. Wow. I like the way Kent Hughes says it. He says, think of it. He owns all the heavens and numberless worlds, but we are his treasures. The redeemed are worth more than the universe. This this is where the environmentalists and the animal activists, they get it wrong. Yes, God does care about his creation and we should be good stewards of what he has given us. But God's people are far more valuable to him than anything else, than the planet, than the animals. And as Christians, our focus should be on the souls of man because that is where God invested everything. That was his investment. We were his investment. We are the riches of his glorious inheritance. You are a valuable and precious child of God. That's how God sees you. You are his most valuable treasure. And I hope that you can see that today. I hope that, that, that this truth awakens your spirit today to walk as if you were made of the most precious gold. Because that is how God sees you. You belong to Him. So so Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts would be opened uh, to the the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and that God sees us as valuable treasures. That's what he wants us to see. And then he prays for one last thing. He prays to, to open the eyes of our hearts to see the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Listen, Paul makes it clear here that this power is aimed toward us who believe. Uh, Toward toward those who are his treasures. Towards those who are, are called to the hope of Jesus Christ. And he says that this power is so great that it can't be measured. It, it is immeasurable. It is limitless. We cannot gauge how great this power truly is, church. But there are two things that we can say for sure. And that is uh, that it is great and that it is toward us. That means that it is for us. It, it has been given to us. And it's, it's, it's the same power. Listen to this. The power that he's talking about that has been given to us. It's the same power that God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. Church, we have resurrection power within us. Wow. We are free from sin and shame and darkness, and we carry that power that overcame the grave with us everywhere we go. And to be honest, I don't think a lot of us truly know this power apart from our own salvation. We know that the power of God has saved us. But I am grieved by the fact 
that we don't truly use or understand the power that God has given us. I, I want to see the power of God working in a visible and tangible way. But it will only happen if we actually see that it is there. And I wonder today, can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see that you have the, the resurrection power of God at your disposal to, be, to, to use for the glory of God? This isn't like sorcery power where you go around and, and do superhero kind of stuff. This is resurrection power to do the works of God. Can you see God's resurrection power being displayed through your life? It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's that power. We have the power to raise the dead. Did you know that? Charles Spurgeon says it like this. This is very profound. He says, the very same power which raised Christ is waiting to raise the drunkard from his drunkenness, to raise the thief from his dishonesty, to raise the Pharisee from his self-righteousness, to raise the Sadducee from his unbelief. Church, that's the power of God within us. That's what the power of God can do. It can change lives from the darkest pits, from the, the lowest valleys. Resurrection power can leave that in the grave. And I wonder, why are we not seeing more of this power in, in our own lives and in, in the lives of the people that we are in contact with? Why are we not seeing more of this in our church services? Why, why are we not seeing more of this in our marriages and in our families? Why aren't we seeing this power changing the world around us everywhere we go? You know, I came across a really cool little story that I think puts this uh, question into perspective as to why we don't see this as much as I see in Scripture that we should be seeing. So let me read this. It says, just before World War II, a school fire took the lives of 263 children in a little town called Itasca, Texas. Almost every family in this little town that was affected by this horrifying tragedy was affected in some way. And during the war, this little town remained without school facilities. But when the war ended, this town, like many others, began to expand and ended up building a new school. And this new school featured what was called the finest sprinkler system in the world. And as you can imagine, civic pride ran high. Honor students were selected to guide citizens and visitors on tours of the new facility to show them the finest and most advanced sprinkler system technology could supply and money could buy. Never again would the little town of Itasca be visited by such a terrible tragedy. They were prepared, but over time, with the post-war boom, the town continued to grow. And seven years later, it was necessary to enlarge the school. And in adding the new wing, it was discovered that the sprinkler system had never been connected. That's a crazy story, isn't it? They had the greatest sprinkler system in the world. The greatest that technology had, had, had thought up and, and the greatest that money could buy, but somehow they never tapped into it. They were living on the knowledge of what it could do, but were powerless to use it if needed. And I think that, that this is a, a parable of what has happened to so many Christians today. There is untold power available for every believer in Christ, but so many people never hook up. And their lives are, are simply impotent, if that's the word to use. Useless in terms of God's mighty 
power. Church, as believers, we have the greatest power on the tips of our tongues, the name of Jesus. And in the palms of our hands, we can read our word, we can lay hands and pray for each other. And it's the same power that not only raised Jesus from the dead, but it seated him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. And that term, the heavenly places, remember that term, because next week we're going to look at it in detail, because three weeks in a row, Paul uses it, and we're going to look and see how those things fit together. It's really cool. Um, But Jesus is reigning above all other earthly powers on the planet. He is the sovereign ruler, and we are in Christ. He is in us, so that same power is working in us. It's working in you, and I wonder, can you see it? Do you see the power of God in your life and in the lives of those around you? Have you tapped in? Are you using just the minimal? Or have you tapped in? Can you see that you have so much more power available to do wonderful miracles in the name of Jesus Christ? Not for your gain, but for His. Paul says, I want you to be able to see the hope, the riches, and the power of God. And after explaining that power in detail, he tells us one last thing that is vital to our understanding as as Christ. And as Christ's church, I'm sorry. He says this. He says, And he, meaning the Father, put all things under his feet, meaning Jesus, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So let me paraphrase that for you. God made Jesus the supreme ruler and made him the head of the church. He's in charge of the church. He has the final word, and the church is his body. The church is full of Christ, and Christ fills all things everywhere. See, Jesus, in his authority over the entire universe, was God's gift to the church, to you and me, to this community that that we have in Christ. God, God made him the head, and then gave him to us in order to fill us with him and unite him to us. It's sort of this this amazing connection of God and man. We, the church, are his body. We are the fullness of him. Isn't that interesting? In other words, we complete him, and he completes all things, including us. See, it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing, church, that the God who doesn't need anything chooses to be completed by his people. He is the head. I like to say he's the brain, right? It's what I think of when I think of the head. He's the brain. He's the one who makes the strategies. He's the one who makes the plans. He's the one who tells the body where to go and what to do. And and we take him wherever we go as the body. God chooses to have us work with him and to be a part of what he's doing. That's a beautiful thing. We, the church, are the body of Christ, whom is the head, and together we are complete. So, all in all, Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts, uh, the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to see the three things that we have been called to a hope in Jesus, that God sees us as his valuable treasures, that we live and operate out of resurrection power. And then he wants us also to see that, that we as his church have been given Christ as the head of all things. He is the one who shows us and guides us. And in all of these things, we are complete. And I wonder today, can you see it? Can you see it? It's right there in front of you. You just need to see it. You you, you need these, these truths to be more than just words. You need to see them through the eyes of your heart, through the eyes of your understanding. And only God can show them to you. 
I've been praying all week that God would open the eyes of my heart. I've been praying that God would open the eyes of your heart, anyone who views this message. We need to see God for who he is, and we need to start living out what we see and what we know. So I want to encourage you to ask God, pray that he would enlighten the eyes of your heart this week. Be consistent. Don't just do it once. Set a reminder in your phone to tell you, pray and ask God, open the eyes of my heart. Enlighten the eyes of my understanding. Pray, be consistent because he hears our prayers and he wants to give us the desires of our hearts. Now, in closing, I'm going to ask you all to stand up with me wherever you are. I don't know if you're, you're with a group of people. I don't know if it's just you, uh, whoever it is, but I want you to stand up wherever you are. We're going to go over our memory verse for this series that I completely spaced and forgot to do last week. Uh, the passage is Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. We're going to use uh, the ESV translation. And uh, this is what it says. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that you reveal to us as we are able to, to comprehend. So Father, I ask that you would open the eyes of my heart, that you would open the eyes of everyone's hearts who is watching this today to see the hope and the riches and the power that is within us, Father. Let us see you for who you are and let us understand how you see us as your treasures, Father. I thank you so much for today and I thank you for each and every one watching. I pray, God, that we would go home and that we would meditate on this and that we would pray consistently every day that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can see more of you as you reveal more of yourself to us. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please remember to, to share this message if you can. Like it, comment on it. We would really, really appreciate it. I want to say thank you for watching today. And as always, just want to say thank you for staying faithful in your giving. Uh, please continue to do so. Uh, we, if we want to keep operating the way that we are, we have to be able to continue to pay the bills the best that we can. And we want to be able to go out and do more than just sermons. So we need your support. We want to say thank you for always being faithful. Continue to do so. Uh, we give you a couple ways to give. You can give online uh, on the website, uh, which is newvintagechurchaz.com. And you can click in the right-hand corner uh, on the link that says give. Uh, it's quick, it's easy, and it's safe. Or we also give you the opportunity to give the old-fashioned way, which many people do. Uh, you, can, you can mail it snail mail. Here's the address for the church. It is P.O. Box 8704, Surprise, Arizona, 85374. Well, once again, thanks for watching. We love you guys. We're hoping to be meeting sooner than later. Uh, some of the things that we were looking into have fallen through. Uh, but at this point, we're looking at July until AMC is actually giving us the go-ahead, and we'll have to work around from a few things that way as well. But until then, we love you, and we'll see you next week.